Hello, everybody, and welcome to another panel from Big Bad Con Online. Uh, we're really excited about this panel today. Uh, our topic is how to design your first TTRPG and dun, 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 publish. So uh, qu 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 quite a super interesting, but also pretty big topic. Uh, join us as we go over the basics of creating your first game and getting it out there. In this foundational panel, we'll cover everything you need to get started. So our goal is to help you gain the confidence and knowledge you need to take part in a growing community of indie game designers. So first I'm gonna talk about um, who we are, right? We're gonna introduce ourselves. So Kristen, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Yeah, that sounds great. I'm so excited to be here. Hi, I'm Kristen, uh, she, her pronouns. Um, I am a game designer, writer, and podcaster. So Ray and I were talking about this because we both have games that have been published, whether we have self-published them, whether another publisher has picked them up. Um, and so I'm just really excited to be here with you all today and, uh, and share my experience. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So hi, I'm Ray. My pronouns are they, he. Uh, I too am a game designer. I like to make games. I started making, uh, sorry, I just only went back to that very first time I making a game. <laughs> Ooh, I just had some war flashbacks. OK, but, <laughs> but I started publishing online on itch.io. Uh, I think we're going on, I think it's close to three years. What is time now? It has to be about three years, if not more, a little more than that. Uh, yeah, so I'm really excited to get into this topic. It's very important to me. I would love to see more folks uh, getting their games out there, especially uh, people of color, especially marginalized folks, especially uh, queer folks. So um, if you're listening, I'm talking to you. Please, let's get your games out there. We're here okay. For you. Yeah, we are. We are, in fact, here for you. Uh, yeah, so. I want to briefly go over how uh, important this panel is, hopefully, right? So we know like it can be really hard just to get started, like how to, there's a, it's not really difficult, but there is a lot to consider. So this panel will go over um, as much as we can uh, to get you there. It's very easy to feel overwhelmed by all the options, what you have to do. Uh, there are lots of like questions that come up. Like it's very easy to look at people who are established in the TTRPG space um, and assume that you have to just like start out like that out of the gate. That is absolutely not the case. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna help you know where to start basically. So, but we can't cover absolutely everything. So Kristen, we if can. I could ask, well, <laughs> I mean, until I figure out how to handle the time space continuum in one hour. Um, <laughs> but uh, Kristen, can you talk a little bit about the scope of our panel today? Yeah. Uh, so we definitely want to go over creating your, your first game, right? Your very first game and how to get it out into the world. Because again, like Ray said, it can be so overwhelming. Even now with me having games published, um, and games out there, I will get a game idea and I will start to think it all the way through. Like, I'm really excited about this idea and I wanna write about it and I wanna create it and I wanna share it with people, but I will think, I don't know about the right art or I want I want it to be cards, how do I do that? So really, we're gonna, we're gonna take all that, kind of take all that away and come back to your first game and how to get it out there. Um, as Ray, I believe, already said, but it's important um, to say again, everything we're going to talk about can and probably has been or will be its own panel. So we're not going to be able to cover everything. Maybe next year, Big Bad will give us five hours and we'll try it. We'll just be here for five panels straight. Absolutely. We'll let With lots know. of coffee. Um, but yeah. I think that I think that covers the scope of it. We hope. Yeah, this absolutely. Absolutely. So this will be an overview, basically. Yes. Yeah. So the very first step, and this is like a really, really important step, because as a designer, as a creator, you will keep coming back to this over and over again. So the stronger this first step is, mm -hmm. the easier everything else will be from this point. Right. So the first one is identifying the goal of your game, right? So 
this can be as simple as like ha ha people having fun, but what kind of fun? Like what does fun mean to you? Like, but what will the characters be doing? How will they be engaging with with your game, right? Mm -hmm. So like what, what creative space do you wanna offer? What is the goal of your game basically? And also what are its themes, right? Cause then it'll be easier to think about like more of the design and more of the writing. Mm -hmm. Like I personally uh, try to come up with like two to four themes per like game I'm working on, right? Yeah. And then, so I keep coming back to it. Like, am I still on theme? Am I still like aligned with what my original goal was, right? Cause yeah. it was a lot harder when I made it without any themes. I'm like, I guess, I guess this is the game. Right. <laughs> but when you right. identify those themes, I was giggling because I imagined that disaster and flirting are always two, which is why you must go two to four. <laughs> I know, I oh know my gosh, I'm games, so right? called out. <laughs> I'm so called out. Oh my gosh. Literally, the apocalypse keys, two of them, are in fact about getting into entanglements, right? Mm -hmm. Is how I worded it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, yes, you were always on the verge of, wow, I feel really called out. I'm so called out. My disaster gay is showing. Um, but, but here, here <laughs> but I'm we here are. here for it. It's part of what <laughs> makes you such an outstanding designer. But yeah, right? I think it, mm -hmm. it is really important to find that theme and then hold on to it. So I am a player first. Um, unlike, unlike Ray, I'm not a, I'm not a gifted GM. Um, I'm definitely a player. And so I always, always approach game design with when I play this game, how do I want to feel? Do I want to deal with relationships and grief? Do I want to swing an enormous sword? Like, how do I want to feel as a player? when I play this game. And I think if I can hold on to that and stay true to it, um, then it usually works out for me. But that, as Ray said, is something that can get lost, right? And if you can, if you can hold, it's okay if it changes, right? If you feel that your game changes, that's your creative space. But try to hold on to what you really want to make versus making it work for something else. I think that's important. Ooh, yeah, you know, that's a good point because I, for the longest time, I was a forever GM. So I only started playing regularly for the last three years, maybe online oh, okay. with the Gauntlet community. Yeah. And like, I realized some of the difficulty I had with some of my game design was I had to like design how to GM the game. Like I had to be more clear about certain components mm -hmm. that felt very instinctual to me as a GM, right? I was like, don't, doesn't everybody run Powered by the Apocalypse this way? Doesn't everyone just like not prepare? Yeah. And write one sentence and then write many sentences after the game because I didn't prepare. <laughs> so I have to remember all the stuff I made up on Notes. the spot. Notes. Um, but yeah, so so that's a good point, right? That's another one about the, okay, don't get distracted, Ray. Stick to the, <laughs> <laughs> so many tangents. We'll, we'll, we'll avoid all of them. We'll resist temptation. I'm so uh, proud of you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so uh, another, so the next step, so right, our first one, like I said, identifying the goal of the game, yep. as Kristen emphasized, the themes are super important, uh, what the players will be doing. Next is figuring out the design or the system. So this can, this can take a while, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe. Right, right. So uh, Kristen, can you lead us through this one a little bit? Yeah. Um so I think the first thing we, this will not be a tangent, I promise. With design, the more that you write, play, GM, read other people's systems, the better you are at GMing, playing, designing, right? It all feeds each other. Um, you don't have to do all those things. It's just helpful. Uh, and so playing lots of different systems or at least reading lots of different systems um, because you don't have to make your own system. Now, if you want to, we're here to support, we're here to encourage. But I think lots of people come in and feel like, okay, I have to do something that hasn't already been done. So let's make a system using 50 D10s. You don't have to do that unless it's your passion, in which case, great. Uh, but thinking about the theme that we talked about already, 
look through different systems or play different systems and keep that theme in mind. Is Would PBTA work for your game? Would the Bob system work for your game? Would lasers and feelings work for your game? And really go through those and kind of identify what might work. And like Ray said, sometimes you try a system and it just doesn't work. And so you just scrap it and you move on to the next. We oh, all yeah. do it, right? We've all been there. We've all yep. been there. Yeah, absolutely. No such thing as waste of time. Nope. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You still learn something. I also want to quickly say like, yeah. Um, right? Like people feel pressured, like, oh, I have to come up with a new system. I have to come up with something new. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, like, even though Powered by the Apocalypse is a system and an engine has been around for like around 10 years, if not more, I still think we haven't really pushed the system. Like it took so long just for people to get the hang mm -hmm. of several core components that were within the game. Like it was just that innovative that it really took a while for it to fully sink in. Um, I still think about like, for example, Pashon de las Pashones, which is like really pushing the boundaries, mm -hmm. right? And that's just like one example. Um, and so there's there's so much ground to yet cover within these established systems. And you have the bonus of like leaning into like what has come before, right? So yes. that being said, there's still a lot of fun in creating your own system. I have, I have done both. Um, mm -hmm. and they're both, and they're both fun and they're both great and they both serve the game that you're making. So, yeah, I just, yeah, I completely agree. And I think that moving around different systems, again, just want to emphasize that there's nothing wrong with that. I have had a game idea, oh gosh, for at least seven months now. And I still, it does not have a home yet. I still have not found a system and that's okay. Oh yeah, I know, right? I know. <laughs> but also my Capricorn fixed brain is like, let's talk about this. Let us, let us. No, but it's, it really can take a yeah. while. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not to discourage anyone. I've worked on other things. It's not like I've worked on this every day and I can't find it. I don't want anyone to get discouraged. Um, just if you are working on other things or you have a busy life, like most of us do, don't feel bad if it takes some time as long as testing different systems and doing game design is still bringing you joy that's really all that matters. Oh yeah, very yeah. quick tangent, right? Like just to, yeah, for a lot of us, um, TTRPGs cannot be a full-time thing, right? Mm, so, correct. Um, and so, I mean, for me it is, but through various circumstances, one, number one being I live in the Philippines, so it's a bit easier, uh, but yeah. And so like, but I really want people to not feel pressure to have to work on game design every day, every week, just whenever you can manage it, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's all that matters, right? Whenever you can carve out the time, that's yeah. all that matters. But, yeah. And that can be difficult, I think, especially when you touched on something really important in the beginning, Ray, which is people come into this space and they look at folks who have X amount of games out and are, you know, rolling out their third Kickstarter of the year or third crowdfunding of the year and they're writing for D and D. You know, it's just, it can feel really easy to compare yourself. And then if you don't feel like you're making your game quickly enough, that can kind of add to any sort of imposter syndrome. Um, we all feel it. I, t I have a t draft in my tweets from like last week that says telling my imposter syndrome that just because I'm not making a game quickly does not mean I'm a bad designer. <laughs> so we all. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it's like your first game, like just because I haven't, you know, you can't tell yourself, oh, I should make my first game faster. I should get it out there. It has exactly. to be perfect. Right. Like you need to, yeah. you need to tell that imposter syndrome and, yeah. and that little voice to, to please stop. <laughs> And then also, I think small, right? We talked about this small for your first game is good. Now, again, this isn't the rule for everyone. So if your passion is to make a Forge in the Dark game and you're 200 pages in watching this panel, please don't scrap your work. We want to see it. But small is completely fine. My first two or three games are one page lasers and feeling sacks. And you know what? That's great. It's great that I did that because I have a game and it's out there. Ray, I don't know yeah. if you know how to make a small game. <laughs> I Oh, oh, I'm attacked again. I'm so, you know it's because I love you so much. <laughs> I used to be able to, you know, like, 
uh, I don't, I used to be able to. My first yeah. game was four pages uh, okay, for the sad so like game jam. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Three columns, small font, cheated a little bit, but it's three pages. <laughs> and, and it's literally only three pages because that was the rule. Like you couldn't make a longer game. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I used to make, I used to make shorter games. I've just reached a point where <laughs> I just like tackling really big. But I started making yeah. a small game again recently. It's only 14 pages so far. Like, what is that? Like, I might oh. cap it at 20. Unbelievable. Anyway, but for everybody, I really encourage um, one page games, half page games, business card games, whatever yep. works for you. I feel like for me, it really helped me, like, because all my initial games were small, mm -hmm. like just a few pages each time, it really helped me build my confidence as a game creator it really also helped get me out there right mm -hmm. and help like connect to other designers on twitter and and in other places and so that couldn't for me personally right it couldn't have happened if i was just working on my one magnum opus uh right. from the start i i say this looking at apocalypse cues um but it took me a few years to get to that magnum opus so far so just yes saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So small games are encouraged, I think. Right, Ray? I think that's our message is like, go, go small, get it out there. There's something about getting your first game done and out there. Um, and I'm not encouraging rushing by any means, but there are lots of folks who can get something all the way to almost the end. And then that last push, that right? last 10%, so that hard. Last 10%. Did I play test this enough? Is it, is the system right? What if I tweaked the word on this move? You could do that for, I'm not calling you out, right? <laughs> I swear. I, that. I, I swear that. I wasn't. I was actually thinking about myself in a specific move that I have rewritten three times so far. Oh my um, gosh. But getting really getting it out there, it does not have to be perfect. You don't have to play test it a specific amount of times. Just get it out there and you will start to feel better, I think, and more encouraged to continue to design if that's what you would like to do. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, like I think a really important thing to consider is that so there used to be a lot of pressure to have a complete finished game, but mm -hmm. because of things like itch.io, which if you haven't heard about it, is mainly an indie video game uh, platform where you can publish mm -hmm. your games, but we TTRPG folks have hijacked certain portions of it. And now there is this thriving TTRPG section on itch.io. Uh, so I, and the cool thing about itch.io is that the game jams, which are, which are like usually like, one month to two month long affairs of like they give you a theme or a system and they encourage you to design games around that and a lot of it is just submit the game mm -hmm. to either the game jam or just to publish it just to upload the pdf the google doc the text yep. file whatever it is onto itch because itch has this really strong supportive energy of you can get the game out there first Mm -hmm. and then continue to work on it, right? You can offer it for free if you're more comfortable with that or pay what you want, uh, or just, I, I honestly recommend a minimal fee uh, at the very least. Mm -hmm. And then like, as you go back and you keep working on the game, you can you can really um, build it like as you like through different versions. Like one of my published games, Our Haunt, started out as a game jam submission. It was, I used LibreOffice Writer. I, I fought with LibreOffice Writer oh, to lay out that game and to work on it. And yeah, but then now it's, uh, I, I got to work on a second version and it got published through Possum Creek Games. It's now a printed book, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's very cute, it's very pretty, it but it wouldn't have happened if I didn't just get that first version out there, right? It didn't have to be the final version. It didn't have to be the perfect version. It just had to be out there. Right. And, and if I didn't put it out there, a publisher wouldn't have approached me to, mm -hmm. to publish it, right? So. Exactly. And even with Cozy Town, right? The first draft of Cozy Town was out and folks were playing it. And then later you were able to, itch, did you itch fun to that? 
I did it funded. Yeah. It's funded yeah. to get like some additional writers, some additional art. So that's always an option too. You can just because you release a game does not mean you can't come back later and do something else to it if you want to. Yeah. We'll do it really all fun. the time. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um yeah. And so we have like a good question, but I kind of want to did you want to talk about anything else about publishing the game online, Kristen, before we jump into this question? Um, not unless there's anything else you want to add. I just want to emphasize the, like, go ahead and put it out there. It's it's okay. It's such a hard step, and we yeah. acknowledge that it's a hard step, but you can do it. <laughs> yeah, and I also want to say, like, I know that when people say publishing or getting your game out there, we always think about, like, a printed version of the book. We think of it, oh, like, point. Yeah. right, right. But I really want to stress... And I really felt this as a as a game designer. I kept thinking, oh, I'm not really a designer until mm -hmm. something is published, until something is printed. Uh, but your game being on Itch.io, being wherever, being a PDF, being a Google Doc, once again, online, that means it's published. That yep. means you have a published game, right? Yep. So I really want to stress that everything from this point onwards that Kristen and I are going to talk about is optional. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the most important thing is just to get your game uploaded somewhere, yep. PDF, text file, whatever you need to do. Yep. But yeah, so, but we have some really good questions uh, that I'd like us to get to. Ooh. Oh, ooh. these are good. These nice are job, good. Y'all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because it's kind of related to what we've been talking about and then we'll go sure. to the other one. So. Question, what tools do you like to use for writing your games? Google Docs, Word, Notion, Paper Journal. So uh, I'll go ahead and start. I have two answers. One is the correct one and one is the wrong one. So I'll start <laughs> with the wrong one. The wrong answer, which people should try to avoid to do because it's a very hard habit to break, uh, is I used to, I, gosh, I just started a game where I'm doing it again, though. Oh, no. Mm. But I used to designed straight into the layout. So it was Libre Office Writer. <laughs> so as I'm putting the pictures that I would download for free from unsplash.com, that's a nice place to head to if you need free pictures, very artsy. Um, but yeah, so I would like, because I couldn't separate the visual from the game, right? Like that's what I needed to do. Oh, okay, um, yeah. And so now I use Affinity Publisher, which is, if you can get it on sale, they often go 50% off. It's a very good investment. Yeah. Um, don't need to do it for the first game, but it's a good investment. So I like to design straight into the layout program. I have to stress this is the wrong answer, okay? Because- That is hard mode. <laughs> no, I just I just like, for me, right? because like for you. I like, I like seeing it on the page, but I will say later when you start, uh, working with publishers, this is going to be difficult because they will want to lay it out. They only need the text from you, right? So, mm -hmm. I, I, number one, that's a wrong answer. <laughs> uh, the correct answer for me personally is I like to use uh, Milo Note. It's a service. You can try it out for free. Um, I like it because it's sort of like this very visual like piece where I can move around. Um, actually, I'm going to share like a game that I'm working on, on Mila Note, and what Ooh, it looks okay. like. Because I don't think yeah. I've seen Mila Note. Oh gosh, it's super- See, I'm learning. I, yeah, I, but there are like so many similar um, things. StreamYard just yeah. being very helpful and being like, oh, are you sure that you want to do this? Okay. Yes, StreamYard. Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I am absolutely sure. Okay, it's gonna do that weird mirror effect for a while until I skip over there. So, okay. uh, but yeah, um, so there. So is it, oh, whoops, it did it again, there you go. So this is never break the chain so I can put the images here from Pinterest to inspire me. And then I put each playbook here in its own file and then I can move this stuff around, right? Like however I like, I have yeah. my checklist here and like, you know, yeah. I have my vibes, basically, right? I have my, oh, I don't know about these rules. In some right. other cases, I'll have like, eh, old rules, or eh, not sure about this. So I just, this is this works really well for me because it keeps things very flexible. I can see why, I love in it. A doc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very so. organized. Yeah, and then what's nice about Milo, and once again, I have to stress there are several services, um, is that if I have an idea, 
at 2 a.m. Yeah. I can access Milo Note or whatever it is from my phone and I can just go to sleep. Yeah. So, but that's that's me. How about you? I typically, I have nothing as fancy now. I wish I'd gone first. No, no, I'm teasing. I typically start in Word because I will outline a game. So if I'm driving and I think, I do this, friends, I do this many times a day. I have a thought and I think, is that a game? Is that a game? Like this happens to me all the time. So I will open a Google Doc and I will write out as much as I can. If it's a game, like the theme, right? The idea we talked about in the beginning. Um, can I think of a system? What do I want players to experience? Um, is it cards? Is it dice? Is it, I just go through everything as like, not as fast as I can, but basically until I run out of ideas and then I start to fill in the ideas. <clears throat> um, I also use Google sheets. So I'm working on a couple of, um, I'm working on a PBTA game right now. And so I will put, I actually borrowed this specifically from Ray where I lay my playbooks out and, and color code them. Right. And I can and I'm working in uh, Google Docs. The one thing, too, I like about um, Google Sheets and Google Docs is like for the games I'm collaborating on, which is another important topic we can talk about. I um, you can share those. Obviously, I think everyone knows that. And so it's easy to, to collaborate, and make changes and be in there at the same time. So those are my favorite tools to start to just the very beginning of design. That's what I like to use. Yeah, I feel like um, talking about Google Sheets and just showing what's possible. So when I hit a point when my health, my mental health and my physical health are really bad and uh, mm -hmm. I can do my usual bullshit of uh, laying out into straight into Affinity Publisher or something. Yeah. Um, for me, playtesting is very important. And I have to stress like your relationship to playtesting will, will depend on you and your games. But for yeah. me, I love to playtest a lot. So um, so what I would do is I only have enough spoons to work on the game and play test. So I'm just gonna design it straight into the online play test materials. Yes. Is what I would do. So I'm gonna share once again, what that looks like. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so once again, it's just gonna be a little weird. I apologize uh, as that happens. Kristen, let me know when you can see it on the screen. Okay, I can see it. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So this is the, Character, yep. this is the Twilight Throne, Forge in the Dark Game. And then so there's a player reference tab. And then um, this is uh, the character creation scheme mm -hmm. and guideline, right? And then we have like the different, I put all the crew, the equivalent of the crew play sheets um, yep. here, but everything is here basically. Yeah, um, and organized in different tabs. It's, yeah. Yeah. And then I love and that. It a, and this is, this stuff is fairly simple, but Everything else, like I keep the boxes here. There are pretty ways to do this, but it's fine. Like it's okay. Right. It doesn't have to be perfect. Right. Just yeah. enough for people to be able to play test it um, is key. I also put in like a lot of the rules in these floating notes. Yes. Uh, that's always yeah. helpful. Yeah, yeah. I but, think. but that's also another way to to go about it. Um, yeah. was there anything else you wanted to add to tools, Kristen? No, we can move on to other we have other questions, I see. Yeah, really good ones. So yeah. one that's associated with what you were talking about, Kristen, is like, what system? A really good question is, I have a B.O.B. baby, uh, a belonging outside belonging baby. I've been working on playtesting for a year mm -hmm. and I've been hitting a bit of friction with the system. I kind of want to do Powered by the Apocalypse, but there's already a super established game in that genre. So I've been really struggling with this thought of, well, why would anyone play a game in a genre that's already covered? So I feel you deeply yes. I just wanna put that out there. Um, yeah. But I feel like, wow, I feel like we're doing like one of those like columns in a magazine, but my instinct is telling me that your game design instinct is correct, right? And so I really want to stress that it can be really easy to tell ourselves that, oh, there's a, there's a huge established game, like Urban Shadows, right? Is a very huge urban fantasy game and Apocalypse Keys, the game I'm working on, is also like an urban fantasy game, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also using the Powered by the Apocalypse system. Mm -hmm. And it's even using like a similar thing, like the corruption track in Urban Shadows is similar. Like that's what I drew inspiration from for the Ruin track in Apocalypse Keys. But now when you look at Apocalypse Keys and Urban Shadows, they're completely different games, right? And so 
But if I had listened to that voice early on, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have done it. Like, I really feel like you should give yourself more credit yes. as a game designer, as a creative. There's so much space in the genre. If there can be hundreds and thousands of fantasy games of going into a dungeon and beating up monsters, you can make another one in the genre, right? I promise Absolutely. you. Yeah. So just trust your instincts. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's my that's my take. But how about you, Kristen? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, same thing. Trust your instincts. If you want to, if you feel in your gut, in your designer gut, that it's a PBTA game, make the PBTA game um, powered by the apocalypse. Uh, if you feel comfortable, have a couple of colleagues or friends look it over. <clears throat> excuse me, or play test it, kind of just to make sure. You don't have to, but if that makes you feel better because you're unsure, then you can. You know, you can absolutely do that. Um, but as Ray said, there, there is not a genre we haven't covered, right? So everyone is making games that is already part of a genre. And what's unique about your game is your voice. And we don't have a game from your voice yet. And we want one. So please make it. A hundred percent. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, we are far more creative than we realize. Our voices are more unique than we realize. So, Absolutely. so essential, so essential. Um, yeah, I wanna try to cover as many questions as we yeah, can. Yeah, Um, Cause these are good questions. Uh, so I want us to go over, how do you effectively play test through various phases of the development of the game? Mm. So um, what's, your, what's your take on that, Kristen? <sighs> effectively play test. Um, so maybe this will be helpful if we if I just talk about how I play test. Um, so typically what I do is I get a game to a place where I realize the next step is, does this even work? Oh my it, God, it's true. Will, will the wheel stay on? <laughs> will the wheel stay on for two to four hours? I have no idea. Let's take it out for a drive. Um, <clears throat> and then I will typically play test it and I will run it, or my my co-designer uh, will run it. We will not play in it, if possible, to make sure that all the players cannot, you know, that a designer doesn't influence the play test, if possible. These are not hard rules. Everything is flexible. Um, and I usually just make sure, will the wheels stay on? If the wheels stay on, then I make any tweaks that were helpful from that play test, and I do it again. And if the wheels stay on again, then I do focused play tests. Okay, now we're gonna test the combat. Now we're gonna test the magic. And I think one of the important things about that is letting your play testers know in a very nice way um, that what you want feedback on. So we're gonna play the game, but I'm really focused on the combat piece or on the relationship piece or on this specific move. Can you please give me feedback on that? And that helps you, I think, make those like fine tunes to, to your game. Um, yeah. Ray, what about you? Yeah, I, mean, I agree. love a play test. Right. I love, so. play, I love a play test. I yeah, love same. Um, I run about like two to four play tests every week, basically. Um, but yeah, and so I agree with everything you said, Kristen, except I am the perpetual GM. I am often running my own game, which uh, has its own challenges, right? Because if you're... I tend to design the game up to what the player needs to make it, to trick them into thinking it's a full game, right? Mm -hmm. And then all the GM stuff I'm making up in my head yeah. as we are playing. Um, so that's um, that's what I tend to do. Uh, but also what has worked for me lately, because Kristen brought up so many good points, but for me is because of my bad brain stuff and my anxiety, it can be, mm -hmm. I used to be able to run public play tests very easily, but that hasn't been the case. Uh, for the past year or so. So what I do instead is I have this core group of play testers. I have two people in particular. Uh, shout out to Josh and Sherry, who I drag into every single <laughs> play test. I have two in particular who work for me, and I'll briefly say why. Because Sherry is a player who doesn't study the rules, doesn't look at the rules too much, but but really gets into her character and really tries to think things through and solve problems as a character, as a player. So if the rules get in the way of her doing it, and if the rules are hard for her to pick up in the moment, I know I have to throw it out, right? And then Josh is someone who really likes to study the rules, who will try to like find the commonalities that I wouldn't see and like try mm -hmm. 
and stretch things in really interesting ways. And Josh and I also talk in the same design language, so that helps me. But mm -hmm. what's really important between those two is that they understand the kind of games I want to make. Absolutely. Right? They understand what my theme, they know I'm a disaster gay. Uh, so they understand <laughs> that fully. And then so the other two to three players, I switch that out all the time. But those yeah. two are, I try as much as, like they haven't not been in a play test for like, I want to say like a year and a half now at this point. That's um, awesome. Yeah, I love them so much. Thank you. Thank you, Josh and Jay. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I feel like I want us to cover just a little bit of some of the other stuff and get to some sure. of the other. Let me, let me quickly say one more thing about play testing, then let's then pick another question, Ray. W really quickly, because you said in your question, effectively play test, if you can hand your game off to a group and do a blind play test, because what is in our head is different than how someone else may read it. And so to it's a good step. It's not required. It can be a good step to make sure that someone else can pick up your game and play it if you if you want to go that route. So, okay. 100%. There's a really good question here. Okay. Uh, so when do you trust your designer instincts to keep a system the way it is? And when do you listen to feedback and change it? So this could be a whole panel. I'm just going to briefly... <laughs> I'm just going to briefly go over it. Uh, I'm going to say number one, resist the urge to knee-jerk tweak or redesign, right? Like just take note mm -hmm. of what people said as much as possible. Try it in different play groups and see if that's true, right? I'm going to bring a specific example. So in Balik Bayan, when I play tested the game, some people were like, oh, this, this Duende playbook is so overpowered. I can do so much with this playbook. And in that same play test, I was like, yeah, the saint is so underpowered. I can't do anything with this playbook. And so I just took note. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the next play test with another group, I had the exact opposite thing. Like, oh, the Duende is so underpowered. The Duende can't do anything that I wanted to do. And then they were like, oh, but the saint's so overpowered. The saint has a satellite that they can activate because of the gods, <laughs> which is true. These, these two things are true. And so it really helped me see like, oh, a lot of it is like player perspective, right? A lot yes. of it is like vibing with what they picked up. Um, so players can very often, like their feedback is really, um, can be really, really helpful, but they are not coming from an objective place, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of times, even me as a, as a play tester, uh, I keep in mind that I can say what I think the problem is but it's usually not what I think it is. So what the actual problem was, was I was not effectively communicating what the playbook, like what the themes were and what you could do with the playbook. I had to tweak the first bit of text you read so people could more easily understand, oh, I'll have an easier time picking up, picking up this playbook versus mm -hmm. the other one. It's, it's very subjective, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, oh my gosh, I went over. I, said, da, 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 da. I didn't mean to really get into it. So, but basically- no, no, that's perfect. Yeah, resist the knee-jerk reaction to design. Keep playtesting it to see. And then after a while, as you keep doing it, you will hone you will. your instincts to the point where you're like, okay, I know I have to change it quickly. Or I know I have to, like, trust. It's a muscle that you build. It is. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, yeah, so oh, there's so many good questions. But I kind of want to very briefly, uh, yeah, I feel like... Um, in terms of, I just want to quickly say in terms of like uh, art, layout, editing, all of those things, these mm -hmm. are skills that you can develop over time, right? I don't want people to feel pressured to have like really amazing layout and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and invest in really good art from the start. But what do you think, Kristen? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I think that's one of those things that when we talked about in the beginning, overwhelming that you can feel overwhelmed if you are at any stage of design and you start worrying about how you're going to find um, and may honestly pay for, right? Because everyone should be paid well. Um, your artist, your editor, the person who does layout, graphic, all of that stuff, right? That can be overwhelming. That is none of that is required for your first game. If you do have some funds or you can get free assets, which Ray, you're gonna have to share that website again because I can't remember. But oh, I would yeah. say art. Shock. 
Splash.com. Yeah. Unsplash. I'm going to put Unsplash. it. Unsplash. Yeah, I'm going to put it in our private chat and we'll ask. We'll share it. We'll share it. <clears throat> I'll ask our Twitch mod to like put it uh, yeah. in the in the chat. But yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So that's just. Yes, all those things are great. You can you can absolutely do all those things, but they're not required. So my advice would be just don't get overwhelmed and bogged down by them. Because again, getting that first game out there, you can always come back to it. You can always have perfect layout on your third or 10th game. You don't need it for your first. What do you think, Ray? Yeah, no, 100%. I absolutely agree. And I feel like, because there's a lot of pressure to get into crowdfunding to work with other people and like yes. these are very big steps right I really recommend just starting with smaller things like if you can collab with other people who want to work on games with you you know and do a skill share skill mm -hmm. exchange you can do that too but uh really it's just important that you yeah. get that first game out there so okay. I want to like try to uh, thank you very much, William, for putting that in yes, the chat. Yes, thank you, William. Um, I just, there's so many good questions. I think one that I want to cover real quick is how would you go about advertising a game that's published online or getting it out there on itch? So that's also another panel, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that it's really hard. Um, mm -hmm. What What has worked for me is just being very active in different online spaces and really trying to engage meaningfully and sincerely with different communities. So communities of game designers, communities of players, right? Um, with If you are talking about your game on Twitter, you have to talk about it all the time. Like, I know that all can be hard. All the time. Yeah, you'll be like, oh, I posted about it once this week. That's enough. But I swear, after you post something on Twitter, if someone isn't looking at their feed within the next five minutes, it's gone, right? So I can post about something eight, 12 times a day for like two weeks. And then someone who's a mutual I talk to all the time will only see it for the first time, like in it's that me. last day. <laughs> <laughs> so, Algorithm. But, but, yeah, <clears throat> but, but I think the most valuable thing, the long-term thing is to engage with your communities, really sincerely play other people's games, uh, read other people's games. This is a very small knit community and we're here yeah. to support each other. But you yeah. know, if we show up sincerely, that's how, you know, that, that's where I'm coming from, right? That's um, my very indie roots. So I'm yeah. not a publisher, you know, that's a different take on advertising. But what do you think, Kristen? Right. No, I, I agree. If you, if you are, if you do work with a publisher, a lot of that's gonna be handled. Right, but we're not we're not discouraging you from doing that. It's just not required, especially for your first game, right? That you pitch to an established publisher. So I agree with Ray. If you're putting out your first small game, um, then yes, then get involved with the community. I do want to stress what Ray said, sincerely get involved with the community. Um, so engaging with supporting other people. Um, yes, talk about your game all the time and retweet and talk about other people's games all the time, right? It's like a two-way street. Um, to go into any sort of paid ads, I have heard of, um, from folks who are publishing their own games that Facebook ads actually work really well. I have not done this. I know, right? I know. I have not done this. But it's have, really effective. It's also I helpful. Have, I have heard it's good things. Starters, yes. So I just want to give, I, I'm not saying that's, the right thing to do. I just want to put it out there that I've heard from a few like really established designers who've published right their own games that that helps them get sales. Um, so that's something that you can consider. And I think just real quick asking, like I know you just asked, great job. If you know other designers, if you want to reach out to other folks in the space, again, um, if it's sincere, oftentimes questions are, I can't speak for everyone, but oftentimes questions are accepted and met with kindness and helpfulness. So you can reach out. Yeah, and if you're not sure what to do, because Twitter can be hard, you feel like you're you're screaming out into the void. I remember my first six months on Twitter, um, I made the mistake of going to certain groups where I was ignored. <laughs> so yeah. it took me a while to find the right groups. But I will say that um, going to other established game designers who have their Discord servers, is a good way to try like keep going through different discord servers find the community that really speaks to you 
personally, um, I have had a lot of great experience with the Gauntlet community, which you can find online, gauntlet-rpg.com. It is, they're very open to play testing. They play a lot of games. They focus on indie story OSR games. Mm -hmm. And if you're a person who's marginalized in any way, such as, such as myself, um, you let, let them know and then they'll be there to support you. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I think, is there anything we wanna like any last words? that we want to get into, Kristen, before we wrap things up? Oh my gosh, I know. I think there's a couple questions that were unanswered. So I cannot speak for Ray, but I think if we put these in the Discord, if you're on the Big Bad Discord, I can I can answer them. Um, so we can take kind of the questions over there because I want to make sure that we really support all of you folks who are taking time to watch this and ask such good questions. So we'll answer them over in Discord. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there, there'll be a channel dedicated to this topic, to the panel on the Discord. Chris and I will be there hanging out with you all and answering more questions there, so. Yeah, send us, send us, sorry, send us more questions and we'll we'll be happy to help. That's why we're here. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I agree. That's, um, I think my last parting word is if you're thinking about making a game, if you're stuck working in a game, mm -hmm. um, just do it. Just do it as best as you can, but also know that there are so many, there's so many people who want to support you, who want to be here for you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a community of designers and players. And so just reach out, yeah. let people know, right? Like it's it's really important to like build um, those connections, that community. So, yeah. okay, I will. we will go into ITROS. So Kristen, where can people find you online and what are you up to? Sure. People can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Kristen is no Jedi. Um, I just finished up a Kickstarter in January for Adorablins, which is a very, very light PBTA game about adorable goblins going on adventures to find lost items from their worlds. Um, it is absolutely meant for kids. I have a passion for designing games for kids. Again, whole other panel. Um, but I've, I've play tested it with more adults than kids, and it's super fun, light, and improv -y. So you can find out more information about that at DiceUpGames.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at DiceUpGames. Yeah, I have several games in the work. Um, I'm writing for games. I'm on the design team for Kids in Capes, which is going to be published by Hunters. So look out for that next year, possibly. Don't quote me. Um, and I think that's it for me. How about you, Ray? Yeah. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. This is really great. Uh, I want to stress that if you need help, please reach out to me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Temporal Hiccup. Uh, I really want to especially extend this invitation to people of color, uh, you know, uh, queer people. Like it's really super important uh, mm -hmm. to get that extra bit of support. And yeah, you can also find my games on temporalhiccup.itch.io. I also have this website for some reason, www.soarqueengames.com. It's mostly there for my blog. Uh, it's a very simple website, but you know, uh, it is there. And I have Our Haunt was came out recently with Possum Creek Games, my cozy, creepy a uh, B.O.B. game of ghosts hanging out in a haunted mansion. It's a really sweet, freaky, weird, scary, lovely time. Uh, and also I am working on the Twilight Throne, which is open for pre-orders, uh, Forge in the Dark, game of surreal magic, tragic intimacy, and political intrigue. Uh, Apocalypse Keys is, uh, there's so many games that I'm working on. Uh, just like Kristen, just like every designer. Uh, you can find out more about Apocalypse Keys. It's coming out with Evil Hat. Uh, yeah, basically that's it. You can find me on Twitter at Temporal Hiccup, like I said, where I post all my Sailor Moon gifs and my emojis. And uh, recently I talked about my Batman dream. So there you go. But basically that is Kristen and me. Thank you so much, everybody. Please continue to enjoy the rest of the panels. Yes. Continue the discussion on the Discord server. Kristen and I will see you there. But there's yeah. so many other panels to check out. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great time zone wherever you are. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>